welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today in, uh, here in room 11 and also online. Um, this is an event as part of the ECOSOC Financing for Development. And my name is Marina Zuckermarks. I'm a postdoc at SOAS, University of London, and researcher for the debt relief for, um, debt relief for a green and inclusive recovery project. So I will be moderating today, uh, today's session, and which is about uh, reforming the international debt architecture for a green and inclusive inclusively um, development. So this session is organized by our project, uh, which is a collaboration between the Boston University Global Development Policy Center, Heinrich Bloh Stiftung, and the Center for Sustainable Finance at SOAS University of London. We would like to give a special thank you for the Heinrich Bloh Stiftung, which is sponsoring today, today's event. So we all know that a sovereign debt crisis is already unfolding in the global south, and more than half of low-income countries are, are either at high risk or already in debt distress. And some are already conducting debt negotiations. And as the case of Sri Lanka and Pakistan show, debt vulnerability is not exclusive to uh, low and middle uh, low income countries, but also can extend to middle income countries. Uh, at the same time, we have climate related shocks that are becoming more frequent, more severe, and countries need to mobilize at least one trillion of external resources to, to meet uh, climate and development goals according to the uh, Songwe uh, Stern report. So, and um, there are estimations that show that is even more. So the current situation is actually jeopardizing countries' capacity to mobilize the financial uh, needs to achieve the, the green inclu uh, inclusive development. So this panel aims uh, to discuss potential policy solutions to developing countries um, and to allow them to address development and green recovery needs. Uh, we are going to assess the project, uh, the progress of the G20 Common Framework and discuss how to improve the current that infrastructure, uh, uh, that architecture. So um, today, we I'm delighted to have a panel that has a lot of experience in debt issues and financing for development. Um, Uri Vols uh, is professor of economic and uh, economics and director of the Center for Sustainable Finance at SOAS, Univers University of London, and also co-chair of the the project. And uh, we also have Shad Spiegel. With, uh, with us today, who is the Chief of Policy Analysis and Development, Financing for Sustainable Development here at the United Nations. And also, Daniel Muniver uh, from UNCTAD is also joining us uh, today. He's Economic Affairs Officer. Uh, apologize, uh, Hannah Morsi was supposed to be in the panel today, but for unfor unforeseen reasons, she's not going to, to join. So, uh, but um, we, we are going to have a very uh, interesting uh, discussion. Uh, uh, so uh, I will begin by, uh, in, um, by uh, giving the, the floor to Uli, and then uh, Shadi and Daniel. OK, so yeah. Uli, you have the floor. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Marina. And um, uh, great to be here with so many friends, both on the panel and also in the audience. And apologies, my, my voice um, has, has um, uh, partly left me, but uh, I've been probably talking too much <clears throat> over the last week. But um, uh, yeah, I'm very happy to present here um, an overview of our debt relief for green inclusive recovery uh, project, um, which is a project we, that we've set up in 2020, when it was already, at least for us, pretty clear that we were heading towards a massive debt crisis in the global south. Uh, anyone who has studied um, statistics on, on, on uh, debt development uh, prior to uh, the COVID crisis already could see that things were not uh, going well. Uh, and then we've seen uh, the COVID crisis and, of course, now these kind of poly crises that everyone's talking about. And 2020 was the start of what was supposed to be the decade of action, 
Uh, so action with regards to the agenda uh, 2030, action with regards to the Paris Agreement. And we thought, well, um, if we're serious about achieving this development agenda, climate agenda, um, we need to do something about the debt crisis. So that's why we started thinking about some solutions. And uh, we had been working prior a lot about the nexus between uh, climate vulnerability and debt sustainability. And we had shown, for example, that climate vulnerable countries were uh, having to pay a very significant climate risk premium, which um, is undermining, of course, uh, public debt sustainability and impeding investment in resilience. So um, against this backdrop, we thought, OK, um, we really need to um, put forward some proposals um, that can help to tackle the debt crisis and help to uh, enable countries to invest in climate resilience and also development more broadly. And so we set up this project as a collaboration between uh, the GDP Center in, uh, at Boston University, the Heinrich Böll Foundation in Berlin, and uh, SOAS University of London. And um, <clears throat> we have some wonderful co-chairs, and uh, so Yufen Li, one of the co-chairs, is also uh, with us today. And um, let me just present to you kind of the, the key proposals, the key ideas. Um, or maybe before I do that, let me just say why we think we need proposals like ours. Uh, and I think the situation is pretty clear. Uh, by now, everyone is more or less accepting that we have a massive debt crisis uh, brewing. Uh, I think that's a change to, for example, uh, the annual meetings from last October where, you know, there was still some hesitation to talk openly about uh, debt crisis, but, but now everyone, I think, has got it. Uh, and everyone, I think, also understands that the common framework that the G20 put in place uh, is just not delivering. And there are uh, three major shortcomings. Uh, one is that, first of all, it, it, it leaves out middle-income countries, and there are a lot of middle-income countries that are struggling very severely, and they also will need um, support in tackling uh, their debt crises. Um, the second big shortcoming of the common framework is that it doesn't have any mechanisms to really bring all creditors to the negotiation table, uh, and that, of course, also includes uh, private creditors, which for uh, many countries, especially middle-income countries, are really the most important creditors. And last but not least, it doesn't make the link between climate uh, or to, uh, the link to climate and development goals. Um, and uh, we think that's a, a very important omission. So here you have um, a chart, and I'm sorry that we can't enlarge that on the screen, uh, that shows uh, the debt relief for green inclusive recovery proposal in a nutshell. And <clears throat> the starting point for us is an enhanced debt sustainability analysis. So. The IMF and the World Bank conduct debt sustainability analyses uh, where they try to, to um, assess whether a country can shoulder its debt or not. And um, these DSAs have had uh, a lot of shortcomings. Um, I mean, uh, very evidently, they've been using far too optimistic projections on growth, which, of course, then makes countries look much better. Uh, but Essentially, uh, these DSAs look at the ability of countries to repay their debt. Um, and they don't really uh, look at the ability of countries to also invest in critical areas, uh, including climate resilience or uh, social spending. And uh, so we've been arguing that uh, we need a much enhanced debt sustainability analysis that really does account for um, not only climate risks and impacts, but also uh, for critical investments in um, climate resilience, in uh, also climate mitigation, uh, but also other critical spendings for the SDGs. So that's the first step, and uh, based on such an enhanced um, debt sustainability analysis, we can then see which countries do need debt restructuring and which ones don't. And then we have three pillars in our proposal. The first two pillars are for countries 
that do need debt restructuring. The third pillar is for countries that um, don't need debt restructuring. And for those, we have um, uh, some suggestions um, where uh, for countries that don't need debt restructuring, but, but that, <coughs> that will um, need, I'm getting timesheets here. Uh, <laughs> Um, sorry, that uh, will need, um, uh, you know, could do with some fiscal support, and there we foresee some uh, credit enhancement mechanisms so that they, um, uh, you know, debt swaps, credit enhancement, and so on. But the, the, the really interesting part is about uh, the countries uh, that need debt restructuring. And uh, here uh, we need to make sure that all creditors are involved, and that involves both the public and multilateral creditors, and also the private and commercial creditors. And <clears throat> uh, these need to uh, uh, be involved, and we need equal treatment of debt, uh, restructuring, and um, uh, for um, the private creditors, um, which so far haven't been involved at all uh, in the debt restructuring. I mean, there have been, of course, a few countries uh, that did uh, default and, and uh, that we had very slow engagement. So we need to make sure that all this goes much quicker, that we have uh, both uh, positive and negative incentives for countries to, uh, for, for creditors, private creditors, to join uh, debt restructuring and um, on the, uh, so we're talking about carrots and sticks. Uh, regarding uh, the sticks, we uh, talk about a debt service suspension for countries seeking restructuring so that the moment a country uh, uh, seeks debt restructuring, uh, automatically all payments are halted, uh, which will also put pressure on creditors to, to uh, come to the negotiation table. Uh, but we also need all kinds of regulatory measures, especially from the jurisdictions where uh, uh, the private debt has been issued, and that's basically the state of New York and um, uh, London, and then a few other smaller uh, financial centers. Uh, there we need uh, uh, regulatory measures, executive orders, and so on, uh, to really uh, put pressure on creditors to join. Um, but we also have some uh, carrots, and that's um, building on the experiences of the Brady bond restructuring, where um, uh, uh, private creditors uh, that um, uh, restructure, uh, kind of uh, uh, agree on restructuring, uh, swap their old debt against a significant haircut um, and receive new credit enhanced debt. And we propose a credit guarantee facility um, that could be hosted, for example, by the World Bank uh, that would provide a partial credit enhancement. So um, that is a significant incentive for private creditors to, to partake in uh, debt restructuring. <clears throat> Just uh, very quickly, uh, we just published a new report uh, where we uh, looked at um, uh, countries that have been identified by UNDP uh, and or the IMF as being uh, uh, in, in deep, tr uh, deep trouble regarding the debt. And uh, so we've, we've looked at the numbers and um, uh, these uh, 61 countries have uh, between them, 812 billion of debt that, um, if that's the right number, would have to be uh, restructured. Um, and um, uh, <clears throat> here you have a list, and, and you know, kind of the, the uh, it's probably not, not good to show the list because um, uh, we still do need a proper uh, debt sustainability analysis to really assess which countries need debt restructuring and which not, but, but um, gives you some kind of indication. Um, here you can see uh, who's holding the debt, um, and uh, of these 61 countries, uh, the majority, and that's 27%, is with uh, uh, bondholders. Um, then very importantly, uh, we also have 26% um, uh, uh, with multilateral development banks. Um, and this is why we actually need to also involve those, and, and they hold especially uh, a lot of debt uh, of low-income countries, um, and uh, we are very much aware that um, uh, we, of course, need the multilateral development banks to finance uh, new uh, investment and so on. So that's why um, <coughs> the, 
that's why uh, we absolutely need to protect the preferred creditor status of uh, multilateral development banks, uh, but we also uh, need them to be involved. And there are different ways uh, of covering their losses, uh, which has been happening before with the HIPIC initiative. Uh, we've had gold sales. The IMF has a large chunk of gold lying around that could be used, of course. Uh, there's also uh, a use for SDRs. Um, which is not without problems, but again, there are ways of doing that. Um, one way would be uh, instead of formal rechanneling of SDRs, which hasn't been working very well, uh, to, <coughs> to, um, uh, to um, have the World Bank, for example, issue uh, perpetual SDR-linked uh, bonds, which would be, uh, which open an avenue for uh, central banks to invest in those, and that would still have a reserve uh, uh, character, uh, so it not, would not be the usual on lending. And uh, before Marina uh, uses the hammer, <laughs> I'll just take it and talk more. No. Um, <coughs> I, I, I have basically just uh, two more small things. One is um, we would need an immediate uh, debt uh, 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 payment suspension that would um, um, uh, amount to around $30 billion. Uh, and um, <clears throat> uh, so the amount of debt that would need to be restructured would basically depend on um, uh, the, the uh, debt sustainability analysis. But if we take historical averages, uh, it would be $310,000 billion. If we have some more ambitious... Um, uh, debt restructuring akin to HIPIC uh, that would uh, add another 317 billion. But still, this would be only uh, one way of addressing the problem. We still need a lot of more investment, uh, so we need new financing. Um, so, kind of addressing the debt problem is just one part of a broader solution. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Willy. And now we turn to the UN uh, SDGs. So, uh, Shadi, considering that we are in, a, in the middle of a debt crisis and climate uh, issues is becoming more and more severe, is it still <coughs> possible to achieve the SDGs uh, by 2030? And what the international community needs to do to, to address the, the financing gaps? Okay, Thank you. Um, so first, I, I do think it's worth noting that the assembly is listening. Oh, sorry. I do think it's worth noting, I saw somebody looked up when, um, when Uli made the comment that, you know, I don't think everybody's convinced that we're in a systemic debt crisis. So I think that we have all come to the conclusion that we're in a development crisis and that the, in fact, the way that we articulated the, we, we actually brought the UN, UNDP and IMF together and together came up with 52 countries. Um, looking at both of their data sets. And I think that the conclusion, though, the IMF does not, and you heard this today if you listen to Robert's comments and, and the, the IMF comments in the debt session of the forum, where he said, no, we're not at HIPAA levels, et cetera. And so just to note that um, what we did were able to agree on was that um, I think it's 50% of the world's populate poor live in, these, in, in the countries affected. And so this is a real development crisis, even whether or not one says it's a systemic debt crisis. So just to put that out there. So as you all know, we came we just published our um, 2023 Financing for Sustainable Development report. As you all know also, the report is um, with, this is why we're talking about some of these decisions because it's with the IMF and um, the World Bank and the entire system with UNCTAD, with UNDP. We bring everyone together and we see where we can agree. Um, and we came up with three major um, recommendations this year. The first was this idea that of a green industrial policy. And that, so first of all, the, the main conclusion is no, we are off track. <laughs> and in fact, last year, the report was called the Great Finance Divide. And this year, we came up with that, that Great Finance Divide was becoming solidified. And in fact, over the summer, whereas over the summer, most developing countries have lost access to, um, to markets and financing, this year, some have gotten it back, and we can really see how entrenched that divide is for the countries that are really, um, that are really unable to access 
that the, the, the divide has become entrenched, fewer countries, but a more entrenched divide. And so the theme of the report is really that we are at a crisis point and that we are, um, you know, if we don't invest now and invest in the future and invest in resilience, this will become entrenched, and that while we're dealing with the near-term crisis and have to address the near-term crisis, we can't forget about the long-term, and we need to be investing in the long-term. So that raises the question of where is the money coming from, which is why, of course, there is this big discussion and importance of the, the, the MDB, uh, um, the, the international system. So, so the second message is a big call for both increased ODA as well and concessional finance as well as a really big investment push. But then the question is how do we get there to this really big investment push? And there it's a call, it's, it really goes to the architectural issues and that we really need to reform the architecture including to reform the, the MDB system. Now the MDB system is, the reforms to the MDB system are sort of at the heart of the Addis Ababa action agenda. So the entire, the, they are discussed and brought up as a key component of investment in, um, in sustainable development in, at, at the heart of the thinking of the agenda. And in fact, the Addis Ababa Action Agenda was the first place that called on the MDBs to better use their balance sheets, and as well as for more capitalization, because so much of the agenda is a public sector agenda and needs to be driven by public funds. And one of the issues is that when you have governments going on the cost of borrowing on capital markets, even for countries that have been able to access capital markets, is very, very high. And that is, last year we did a study and, um, with Ugo Panizza, and we also, there's also another study done um, as well that show that first, if developing countries had been able to borrow at the same, at US Treasury rates, what would have happened? And if you look through history, countries had been able to borrow US Treasuries, they would have, everybody would have been better off, including all the countries that had restructured their debt in the past. So that there's a big component of this that's due to the high interest rates. And there was a second study done that looked at the flip side of that, which was what do the returns look like, the actual returns of investing in sovereign debt, if you had just held it over the long term, versus short term volatility. And whatever you look at it, however you look at it, it is the best performing asset class. It, out, it outperforms US equities even when you look at it versus volatility of the markets. And it's gotten more so since the 1990s when you had the bond, bond asset class. So there is all these reasons we talk about how much sovereigns pay, but there is a clear premium that countries are paying. And of course, what does that mean? It's not just a capital market failure, it affects human beings and people living in those countries and the ability to, to, to finance the SDGs. So this important need of having the MDB system be able to finance, because the MDBs, even non-concessional loans, are cheaper, much cheaper than market loans, and longer term. And so to be able to have the MDB system finance, um, fi you know, finance governments is just, um, is, is the only way to really be able to achieve this without running into debt crisis. So that's a big part of the thinking is this reforms to the system, including, of course, this reforms to the MDB system. So um, Uli talked about some of these things, but how do we do this? Where's the, what's going to happen? Well we'll, well, we'll see. It's good that something's happening, but as I think everyone's pretty clear that 50 billion over five years, over 10 years, or five billion a year doesn't really get us. That's in the evolution roadmap, I'm sure you all know. That's the numbers that were put forward, and then that's not going to get us anywhere. So, so that's why this Secretary General called for this SDG stimulus of really ramping up the uh, pu public finance. And there's also, part of that is also thinking about private finance. We could have a longer discussion about that, but this is really the public finance component of it. Um, the second thing though, and I think that this is also really important, is it's not the SDG stimulus and the report do have to acknowledge that we can't talk and say we have debt crisis, debt relief, and let's lend more and more. So some of it, as I said, is because of the interest rate differential. So, but some of it is maybe when a country really has a high, like it's for example, when the um, World Bank says we're gonna do net positive flows, that's great as long as the country's not in debt distress. If a country's in debt distress, if you keep doing net positive flows, you're just compounding the problem. 
So we do need to understand when is it really a liquidity, a, a solvency <coughs> crisis, and when is there a liquidity crisis. So the other problem with the debt sustainability analyses that Uli mentioned is that they don't, they can't, they don't, they don't tell the difference between a solvency crisis and a liquidity crisis. So we propose in the F SDG stimulus, we the SG, the Secretary General, proposes a very simple idea. It says, well, let's forget about all the other problems with the DSAs, and let's just run the DSAs using market rates, which is what's done. It's, they're run, you, you basically, the idea of debt sustainability analysis is you look at the trajectory of debt at current interest rates and, what, and under different scenarios and see which way the path goes. Does it go like this? Uh-oh, it's unsustainable. Does, as you compound your interest, does it go like this or does it go like this? And so let's say you have someone that it looks unsustainable, but then you run it using MDB rates or using U.S. Treasury rates. Let's see what happens. And if there's a difference, a really big difference, then you're telling us that the real reason that you're running into debt distress is because of the cost of borrowing. So there are some simple ways to begin to think about just saying is it a liquidity or solvency crisis, nobody knows. But we can actually do some comparisons to get an idea of whether we're looking at a solvency crisis or a liquidity crisis. So that's a big important part of this as well. Um, so then, of course, um, the, as Uli said, there are also the other thing that it's really, of course, important to emphasize, which I should have said before that, is that we also have two issues when we think about the debt issue. One issue, and Uli said this, so I'm just repeating you. One issue is the issue of, um, of, of when a country's run into debt crises, but the other is just the question of fiscal space. So part of what I've been talking about right now is how do you try to address and help with the fiscal space question. And of course, when the countries are, when the issue is really fiscal space, there are also other instruments like debt swaps, et cetera, that are really helpful in those, in those situations. And we really need to lever those up and you can give country, donor countries, um, climate, climate, um, you know, the credit towards their NDCs and all sorts of other incentives to try to, to try to leverage that up a bit. The other question, of course, is what happens when a country is in debt distress? And a debt swap is very nice, but unless you, it's not going to solve the problem if you have to continue, if you have to continue paying it one way or another. And then we really need to think once again. It's a question of changing the, the machinery. I want to, and, and dealing with the architectural issues. So I want to say, and it's being discussed now every other session and every other session in D.C. But I don't think that there's. We all know that there's not much, um, much um, ambition yet. In, some, in the proposals that, that the system is really looking at. But I, it's really interesting the, at the common framework, you know, my favorite story when some people held up Chad and said, look, we got a private creditor, the private creditors in, and you're like, it's one private creditor. They had one private creditor, that one private creditor managed to slow down the whole process, and that's not even, you don't even have a creditor coordination problem. It's just one guy, <laughs> like why couldn't they cram something down? on that one creditor and force that creditor to take a deal. And even in the case of just one creditor, they weren't able to, to come up with a solution that, that, that was able, they, they got bailed out by commodity prices going up so that they didn't have to really deal with it. But it's just a really worrisome sign if forgetting about the um, creditor coordination issues amongst the official creditors, which is already, which is a big issue, we know, we can see how difficult it's going to be with the private sector. So really some sort of mechanism has to be put in place to, to, to have comparability of treatment. And, it's, and the way that when we talk to government sometimes, and I said this earlier today, so apologies for repeating myself or whoever was there earlier, but, um, but you know, this wasn't such an issue in the past, this cross-creditor issue, because you had countries that borrowed from the official sector you had countries, oh, you can stop me whenever you want, because I'm just, <laughs> you have countries that borrowed from the markets, and there weren't that many countries that were borrowing from both. And so now it's really this new, it, this issue is one that hasn't been thought about. So just to say that um, we also have some ideas we've been thinking about in terms of changing the machinery, because I think, and maybe you'll be talking about the sort of bigger picture solutions, so I'm not going to go there. The, the, I think that we all know, and I think everyone in this room would say, come to the same agreement on what we need, what the first best solution is. And as I said earlier today as well, I don't think I know anyone who works in sovereign debt who doesn't believe that you need some sort of a SDRM type mechanism. 
And if they work in an institution where they claim they don't believe that, when they leave that institution, they change their mind. So I really don't think I've ever met anyone who doesn't ultimately think that that's, that's what you actually need. But politically, we know it seems really, it's really difficult. And so we are thinking, you know, that's the first best solution, but we also need to think, unfortunately, about second best solution. So you all, who NGO, you know, civil society, keep, <laughs> keep pushing for the first best, but at the same time, I think we need to think through second best, which I think is a little what you're doing. We also have some thoughts on some second best solutions. But maybe I'll stop there and pass the floor to you who can talk about the first best. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you very much, Adi, and yes. Uh, uh, now I give the floor to, to Daniel, and uh, especially, if, uh, of course, the, the bigger picture is one question. And uh, also, uh, recently, you, uh, UNCTAD has published the, the TDR, and uh, you, you have highlighted um, how middle-income countries are especially vulnerable, but these countries, they also don't have access to concessional financing. So how do you also incorporate these countries? Um, thanks, and also <clears throat> thanks to, to the project for, for the invitation to, to participate. I, I want to start with an anecdote that speaks to, to the level of energy in the, in the room. So some, some 20 years ago, I was attending a, a conference on development in Cuba, and it was a pretty intense affair because it was like a five-day five day conference, like from, day, from the morning until, until the evening. And the last day, the conference closed with, with a speech by Fidel Castro that started at 8 p.m. <laughs> and it was around 1 a.m. in the morning. The man was still going strong. When all of a sudden he stops and he surveys the, the, the auditorium and he says, I see some people are, are, have fallen asleep. I think we need to do something about it. Please bring coffee to everybody in the room. Uh, and they brought coffee to everybody, and he, last, he continued for like an hour, hour and a half. Uh, so I don't have the power to, 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 to offer everybody coffee here, but I hope uh, uh, a small laugh would, uh, would get you going for at least another 20 minutes. Uh, so that being said, I think... One, one of the things I've, I've been thinking last, since, since last week, and that connects with, with this issue of, of you know, what, what can be done to, to help uh, middle, middle, what can be done to help middle-income countries, it's the issue of, of echo chambers. Like I do feel that, that, that we, that people that work on these issues, have, are, are, we are trapped in a bit of, a, of, of, of an echo chamber that, that has distorted our understanding of, of what the issues. Are and what needs to 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 be done, and I'm and I'm being deliberately controversial to you know again because of the time to keep you awake. Um, so let's if if you look at the at the at the response to the crisis in in and I'm going to also simplify to 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 time constraints. So the the, the response to, to to the COVID crisis and the, and the, and the war in Ukraine and everything else that is going on is just basically. It's composed by, 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 by three pillars. So the first pillar is basically source financing by multilateral uh, institutions. So you have that, uh, for example, MDVs uh, increased disbursement from around $80 billion in 2019 to 106 billion dollars in the context of COVID, and then declined slightly to around 96 billion in 2021. In the case of the IMF, disbursements increased by 50 billion in the context of, of COVID, and there was a sharp decline in, in, uh, uh, in 21. So the, the multilateral institutions have done to an extent what they had to do in terms of providing fresh financing to, uh, to, to, to countries. Then the second pillar of the response is, is liquidity provision. And, and the main element here was the SDR allocations of 21, which provided around $230 billion uh, in SDRs to, to, to developing countries, which is roughly a third of the, of, the total, of the total allocation. And then the third pillar of the response was, was the debt agenda. And in that debt agenda, you had on the one hand, the DSSI that provided a, a, a suspension, debt suspension in, in 20 and 21 
for around $13 billion, give or, uh, give or take, and then you have the creation of, of the common framework with four, um, <coughs> four, four that, in which currently there are, there are four countries participating. Now, what has all of this achieved? in concrete terms. What, what are the problems that, that, that we see with, the, with, with what this response has actually accomplished? So when you look at, at the MDBs, basically the problem that they are facing, and specifically the World Bank, is that in order to provide that surge lending that they did in, in 20 and 21, they had to front load uh, a substantial amount of the resources fr from IDA. So their capacity, to continue providing large amounts of financing, it's compromised. And they have already raised the alarm, we cannot continue basically at this pace because we simply don't have the capital base to, 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 to do so. So that is one mechanism where the ability that we have to continue relying on this going forward is limited unless we change things and this, this goes to the whole CAF agenda, et cetera, et cetera. Then, then let's look at what has happened with the IMF. Yes, the IMF provided a lot of a lot of resources, but those resources are not cheap. So if you look at what has been happening with interest rates, and this is something that was raised by by the um, uh, uh, by Pedro Moreno, the, the, the deputy SG of of UNCTAD. So including surcharges, the, the the borrowing rates of the, of the IMF have have increased from around four percent to seven point five percent. If you look at, for example, the, the amount of money that, 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 the, uh, that the GRA has lent, so they have a, a portfolio for around close to $100 billion uh, in outstanding, on outstanding loans. And just on interest, because of the increase of interest rates over the last 15 months, developing countries, the interest rate bill of developing countries has increased from $1.4 billion to around $6 billion. In, 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 20, in, in, in 23. If you look at the countries that are paying surcharges to the IMF and what, what has, what's going to happen over the next decade for, for a group of 19 countries, interest payments, including surcharges, are expected to increase from around 16 billion to 36 billion over the same decade. So just these 19 countries are basically going to pay back just in interest a, as a quantity of resources that is, it's not, it's close to what the IMF lent in, in the context of the, of, the, of the COVID crisis. So these are expensive resources. If you look, for example, at the RST specifically, it's very concerning because, for example, in the cases of, of, of Costa Rica and Barbados, they are going to be paying in interest to the IMF more resources than what they are getting through the RST because of the, of, the, of, the, of, the, of the interest rate. So, you know, we can discuss how, if, if this is a good mechanism to actually provide support to, 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 to developing countries. Now let's look at what's happening with, 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 with the liquidity aspect of the, of, the, of the story. Last year was a pretty rough year for, for developing countries. And if you look at what happened with international reserves of developing countries, they declined for of, of about roughly $360 billion. So they lost more just last year than what they received through the SDRs. If you look at it specifically at what developing countries have been doing with their, uh, with the, with their SDRs, you see that at least 47 developing countries have used as much as 75% of the <laughs> SDRs that they receive in, in, in 21. You have the cases of countries like Pakistan, like Egypt, like Tunisia, that basically already use all of the SDRs that they, that they receive. And because of the nature of the SDRs, none of these countries can basically expect that they're going to receive more resources unless there is a new SDR allocation. So that's another mechanism that we have used, and that basically is, currently is not on the table to provide more, more resources that is not available to provide, uh, to provide support. And then let's look at what happened on the, on, the, on the debt side. So you had the DSSI, you know, this $13 billion in suspension, but we ended up in a very strange situation where actually the DSSI, which was a mechanism in theory designed to provide support to vulnerable countries, it's actually a pro-cyclical tool because they were able to suspend payments in the middle of COVID where interest rates were close to zero, and now they have to pay back at interest rates that are much higher. 
So it's actually, the, the, the way that the, the DSSI was designed, it's actually making the situation worse. If you look at the, at the world economic outlook, and actually as well the, the international debt report from the World Bank, both publications highlighted limitations of the, of the DSSI, specifically the world economic outlook pointed out that because of exchange rate dynamics, some countries were basically going to have to pay more because of exchange rate depreciation than the support that they received through the, uh, through, the, uh, through, the, through the DSSI. And then we get to the common framework where you, know, you have four countries, but what has happened to developing countries since, since 2019? If you look at the number of countries that uh, have uh, bonds uh, in, in US dollars, you have that the number of countries that have spreads so over 1,000 basis points has increased from four to 19 between 2019 and 2023. If you look at uh, in the week of, of, the, of the collapse of Credit Suisse, that number actually reached 20, uh, 20, uh, 21. And if you look at the composition of these countries, it turns out that out of those 19 countries, 16 are middle income countries that don't have access to concessional financing from multilateral financing institutions, so they basically have no safety net. And 12 of those countries are not eligible to the common framework. And they are in a situation where basically markets are pricing in that, that, they, are, uh, that they are in, um, in, in that distress. If, if you take a step back and you say, well, and what is the more general situation? And this also speaks to, to, to what Sherry was, was talking about, what's happening with the borrowing rates. You have uh, that, that, the, that the borrowing rates, the, as measured by the yields, have increased by around 200 basis points over the, over, the, over, the last, over the last year. And you have a widening on the spread of the yields and the coupons, which is basically means that even countries that have market access are going to have to pay interest rates on those new, on that new borrowing that is substantially higher to what they have. And in an environment where growth rates are expected to go down, that is only going to further deteriorate that dynamics. So it's not a matter of, of whether, you know, like you are going to experience that distress or not, but everybody is going to have a, a much difficult uh, time trying to stabilize their, uh, their, 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 debt, their, their, their debt ratios. So when we talk about last week, well, you know, we, we have all these discussions and yes, we're making some progress. And you look at all of these figures, I cannot say that we have progress. Because progress means that we're think, making things better. But actually, just looking at, this, at these figures, and we can have a discussion, maybe I'm, I'm being too, too pessimistic, but it's just basically we're in a situation where the international response basically simply avoided things getting much worse. But that is it. But that is not progress. So we shouldn't be using that word when, they talk, when, when we talk about the, about the, 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 the response. And what does this mean going forward? And what do, why do we need to, 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 to change things? So if you look at, at the work of, the, of UNDP in their Human Development Index, so in 21, they said, oh, in 2020 was the first year where we had a decline, an overall decline of the Human Development Index. This is a development crisis. Then last year, they say, oh, actually, this is the first time that we have two years of declines in the Human Development Index. And I'm pretty sure that this year is going to be, oh, is this is the first time that we have three consecutive uh, years of, of the clients. And why do I say this? Because when you look at the figures disaggregated of the Human Development Index, 111 countries had the clients in the Human Development Index. And when you map that number into the countries that are experiencing debt distress, you have basically a one-to-one -one match. And you have a situation where in 88 countries where you have a decline in the Human Development Index, they are expected to cut their expenditures over the next five years. We already know that, that, this, is, that, this, is, that, this, is, that this is going to, to, uh, to happen. And this is why we need to change the, we need to change the response. And I'm, and I'm being the, given the, the, the time, so I'll just, I'll just basically just point to three things. I'm sorry I, I didn't get to the, to, the, uh, to the solutions, but the first thing is, uh, uh, um, Pedro was also talking about the, in his key message, what do we need to do 
was what I now call, what I'm going to start calling the M&M &M approach because we said multilateralism, multilateralism, multilateralism. And this is the key thing, and I think this is one of the areas where, where this is doing a really great job uh, uh, here in terms of pointing out that we need to focus on changing the governance system. And until and unless we put developing countries at the center of decision making, things are not going to change. And this relates to something that, that President uh, Lula from Brazil said last week when there was all of this controversy about his remarks regarding the, 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 the US dollar. Uh, the G20 has done many valuable things, but, but there is a truth at the center of the system, which is when a country speaks in a multilateral forum, it's first and foremost about its, in, its strategic interests. And the issue is that the systems and the mechanisms that we have just respond to the strategic interests of a small number of countries, not, the con not of every country. And unless we change that, we're not going to be able to change uh, the rest of the, of, the, of, the, of the things. The second thing, and I'm, and I'm going to, to conclude quickly on this, it's, it's liquidity. We need a new SDR uh, uh, allocation to provide additional support to countries that, that basically are in a very difficult situation. And in the case of that, we basically own that is proposing three things that are in the, in the, um, in the TDR report, which is we need a, a multilateral debt workout mechanism, we need a, a debt registry for, for debt transparency, and third, we need to work on the issue of improve that sustainability analysis. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the three panelists. Uh, I think now we can open for, for questions. I bet there are many. So, so Yufen? Yes, please, you have the floor. This, this is not a question. Uh, just uh, follow up to what Daniel said just now. Uh, I think right now we are facing some very concrete uh, problems and challenges for countries which have defaulted and which are going to default. Um, there is one huge thing which I realize that is the capacity building of these countries. For instance, when uh, Argentina before defaulted, uh, when they faced this litigation case, um, the, the ministry asked me to go there. Everybody, we, we went to meetings, everybody knew debt problems, debt restructuring. And this time I went to Sri Lanka. The officials, parliamentarians, they did, didn't know. And they didn't know how much interest rate charged to the IMF financing. And they didn't know the processes. So, so it, the, the capacity of the government to handle to face debt restructuring is almost close to zero. So international community, NGOs, whoever <coughs> who can offer help to these countries, I think it will be badly needed. Another thing, also concrete, that is Sri Lanka graduated from low-income to middle-income countries. They, they could not get used to that. When they borrow, they forgot the interest rate. When they get the, the money, they didn't know how much IMF is going to charge them. So the, the minister, when we went there, the minister was saying, IMF is charging us 1%, completely wrong. And we calculated, I calculated together with Google during the weekend, and we came up with different numbers. Even between we two, we came up with different numbers. Actually, I might have charged 6.5%. And the government didn't know. The, the officials didn't know. But I'm sure the legal advisor and financial advisors to the government, they, they knew. And they didn't inform the public. They didn't in, even inform the ministers. So here... First of all, for the, for the gradu countries graduating from low-income country to middle-income country, they tend to overborrow. Secondly, they don't know what kind of problems for them to raise liquidity from multilateral sources and from other donors, completely different category. They don't realize that until the crisis 
really fall onto them. So there are lots of problems. And uh, looking forward, I, I see a number of middle-income countries probably will default. Uh, probably they will face the same problems. So I think this is not for, for our project, but uh, I, I'm thinking UN, UN, UNCTAD, DESA, NGOs, everybody should try, you know, do something. Uh, educating the countries, capacity building, everything is needed. Not only IMF and the World Bank, and they don't like it. IMF already said because, you know, um, it's a kind of not a highly rewarding task. Thank you. Maybe we collect like three more, two more questions. So, uh, but Stephen, and then you. Yeah, I also had some, some comments on the proposal. I mean, first of all, thanks for developing it. I think we definitely need more ideas and good ideas to, to address the debt crisis. Um, it's good that you include multilateral debt. I mean, multilateral debt has so far been quite exempted from recent initiatives, but the discussion is indeed picking up now. I think Botswana just reflected in the general debate. VSC has also, also started to push it. Um, we also started to test the idea with some governments, and in our case in Germany. We got a little bit of understanding on from, for it from the Ministry of Finance, strong pushback from the Ministry of Development Corporation for obvious reasons, because um, if it's funded through the MDRI Trust Fund, it will come from the Development Corporation Ministry's budget, so they, they're a bit concerned about the reduction of the resources they have for bilateral programs or other, other um, expenses. Therefore, it's quite interesting what model you um, suggest for to funding it, because I understand you want to fund it not through any fiscal resources, but to the sales of gold reserves, through through internal resources from the World Bank itself, or other MDBs, and through SDR, um, a backed SDR backed facility. That sounds, of course, uh, as a mechanism to address these these political problems we are facing um, with 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 yeah with, with political resistance against um, against multilateral debt relief. Uh, I have to, there have some, some questions, uh, especially on the SDR side. I mean, um, you know that especially in Europe, we face enormous problems with SDR rechanneling, the monetary financing thing that the European Union, uh, the European Central Bank is complaining about. In Germany, we have the actually more, well, not so much technical problem, but more um, political problem that the Bundesbank simply says that development spending is not their business, which is why they're not rechanneling, even if it's technically possible. Um, if you, uh, I mean, what, how, how are you dealing with that? So that's one question. And um, yeah, also, I mean, of course, um, private, including private creditors is, is important. I find it, um, I mean, the, mod the model you're suggesting is, is obviously more based on carrots than on sticks, I, I, I find. Um, I mean, for me, it looks a bit like carrot. I think, which is, which is for us, it's difficult from an economic justice perspective because, I mean, as Shari also put it, I mean, private creditors cashed in huge interest rate, rate premiums in, in in the past, so I think they can write off some some principle in the future. Basically, I mean, this is what they they, they got the interest rate premiums for. So, I think, I mean, more stack, sticks in firm of, of of enforceable participation in debt restructurings might make sense, and. Um, yeah, perhaps last comment. Last comment. I wouldn't call it new common framework countries because the, the I, th I think the term common framework. Can, I mean, it took three years to to take one country through the common framework. I mean, if you want to to take 61 countries at the same speed through the common framework, it will take you 180 years. So probably you should think about a term which is a bit more. I mean, which has more positive connotation. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, okay. My name is Gail Davis, and I am part of the Climate Finance Committee and the FFD Committee with, uh, on uh, NGO Committee. I have a question, and I hope this doesn't sound silly, but is there any way that we can forgive the debt of some of the developed countries? I mean, developing countries? Thank you. So I'll do, and then we open for the replies. Thank you. Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, Shay was uh, mentioning when, when Uli mentioned uh, started at the beginning with the massive debt crisis and uh, there is a broad recognition. I also wanted to say I, 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 I don't get the feeling that it's still so, so massive. Uh, you know that the IMF uh, uses looking at the debt to GDP ratio. They say we are not in the HIPC, HIPC 
moment. Uh, whereas I think, you know, and I commend the UN for having um, looked at this other indicator, which is the number of countries that are paying more than 25%, 20%, sorry, uh, at, which is the same number that we had at the, at the time of the, of the HIPC, more than 20% of their revenue. Um, but today, for instance, when people were talking across many statements uh, about the performance of the common framework, uh, I thought the debate was too focused on is it delivering or not for the countries that are in it. And the piece that I found missing, which I think is more revealing of this uh, development crisis, is another indicator that I hope to be more talked about, which is when we know that there are like uh, 50 to 70 countries that are in a debt crisis, you know, where you take the IMF, you take the UN, UNDP, you know, anybody, more or less, you're, you're, you, you say 61, right, in the, in the DRGR. Um, so, so we are in that number of countries. The fact that four countries only applied, that to me is the indicator to look at. Why are there more countries applying for the restructuring when we know that so many countries actually, actually need one? And that, that is the indicator I didn't hear today that people were, were talking about in terms of what, how revealing it is of the performance of the common framework. Um, second point um, on... Uh, MDB lending expansion. And so here, uh, Sherry, I, I wanted to, something that um, also bugs me is this, um, uh, the amount of lending and what is, what's that going to do to the debt in developing countries. Um, and I, I know the terms are better, but uh, we also have to consider that the borrowing from MDBs is non-restructurable as opposed to other, other loans that are, you know, even the private markets. All, you know, in, in ultimately, you can restructure those loans, but technically with the MDBs, we have this barrier that at least so far we haven't overcome that they don't accept to restructure the, the loans to them. And that, that's, you know, I think we have to weigh that too. And one thing that I think would be interesting to explore uh, is, you know, uh, there are some proposals circulating about the climate clauses or natural disaster clauses from MDBs to countries, but can MDBs themselves issue bonds uh, with, with those clauses? Uh, so, and then, I, because I, I feel that if, if the MDBs can, can uh, issue some of those clauses that uh, share risk, they, then, they can do it in a more uh, efficient way than when a country alone, you know, let's say, you know, Barbados trying to go and on its own negotiate one of those clauses with the knowledge gaps and the transaction costs of negotiating one of those clauses. I think MDBs can do that for a bunch of countries and issue those loans, and they, they can create markets for those, uh, uh, for those clauses, for, for, for instruments with those clauses, uh, which is, you know, and it, it's, it's something that has been around. In, you know, IMF proposed that back in 2017, and the, the MDBs didn't take it up, but you know, I think that would be a, a, an interesting idea to add in, in the toolkit there. And then finally, a comment on, um, so um, um, when Daniel was talking about the amount of surcharges comparing it to the RST borrowing in Costa Rica and Barbados, but I think you, you said it's, we can discuss how the mechanism, how good the mechanism is, but I, I, I believe you are talking about it's a criticism of the surcharges, right? But not a criticism of the of the RST because the RST is providing this. Uh, in fact, RST borrowing is exempt exempted from the surcharges, which I think is a good thing. Um, so um, I, I just wanted some 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 clarification on that because when you say we can discuss how good the mechanism is, it sounded like you are saying that the RST is at stake there, and I, I feel what you are trying to say was surcharges. But Thank you. Thank you. Any any more questions, Roland? And then and then we go to the. My my brain's a little bit fried at this at this hour, I guess. <laughs> so then, yeah. And but um, I guess I have also a sense of duty to also raise the the, the question of the the uh, first best option versus second best option. And I don't think they are incompatible. Uh, so I think we need to keep, I mean, not forget about that first 
best option of reforming the debt architecture and uh, building a multilateral debt workout mechanism, legal framework, you, you can choose the name. Uh, but I think we have the idea. And, and, and we cannot wait to, to keep building at it and to having the discussion. Also because I think having that discussion in the very short term can help the, 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 the solutions and, the, and, and, and even concrete debt restructuring processes. Because if you have a, a, a dialogue, including uh, borrowing countries on the table, you'll have the chance to hear what they have to say about what the problems are. And, and they have problems of uh, accessing information. They have problems of coordination between borrowers. They have uh, issues that can be solved in, in, in the very short term while we build this this best option. I don't, th I don't think we need to confront them. Um, and yeah, I also wanted to highlight this, this uh, issue that, uh, that Aldo mentioned about the, the concern on how focusing on multilateral lending, even if it's concessional, which is important, um, how it will pile up on, on the existing debts and how we will solve that problem if we don't have a mechanism to restructure or reschedule multilateral debts. And if we don't put that on the table, on the discussion, how we deal with unpay unpayable multilateral debts. And, and that is a problem because, I don't know, I've, I'm, I've been studying a lot also, same as you, what happened in the 80s and the 90s, and I can't help thinking we are going th towards the same process of changing a little bit the structure of existing debt by substituting, in this case, bondholders' debt but m by more multilateral debts. And that process ended with MDRI, which was paid by bilateral countries. Um, it's not fair. It's not fair that the, that the bondholders don't take their fair share of the debt restructuring cut. It's not fair that it all, I mean, they, they, they get all the, all, 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 the, all the benefits, they don't take any risks at all. Mm, and, 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 and I'm not saying it's, I mean, accessing multilateral public <laughs> resources at, a conce at concessional terms, it's something that we fully support. But we cannot solve the, prob the debt problem, uh, nor the liquidity, nor the sustainability problem, only by throwing more multilateral money into the pot. We need to solve the problem before we throw more money into the pot. I know it's simplifying things a, a lot, but uh, I, yeah, I, I see that transfer of risks be be uh, between uh, private creditors and towards multilateral and uh, ultimately, uh, yeah, bilaterals. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So, uh, if it's okay, we could over one by like five minutes, and then we can like equally share the time three, three, and three, and we try to wrap up and yeah. Thank you. First, just and stop me if I talk for too long, but I'm, I I was told I might have to run out at any second. Um, so, so very quickly, um, the so the issue of MDBs. I mean, I think we're thinking of first of all, as I said, the question is if a country is in debt distress or has a debt over right now, then we need to, you shouldn't be lending more, and we have to write it down. So I completely agree about that, with that. I think that we're talking that debt in itself is not bad. It's actually good, especially when it's invested, and it's invested for growth. So we really want countries to have the access to affordable, long-term, very long-term, so we're talking ultra-long-term debt to be able to invest. I, I do think that it should also be in local currency. So we have another problem, which is that the co countries are taking the currency risk when the institu international institutions are better placed to be able to take that risk because they can diversify. So that's another reason, and that's a reason why I think with your RST, you are compounding the interest cost over 20 years to say that it's gonna be this. But of course, 
That interest, if we look in real rates, it's not as bad. So if you look at real rates, that doesn't happen. But if you look at currency, the currency effect, it may be even worse. So, so it's uh, this idea of lending in local currencies is probably a really important part of this. Then in terms of the MDBs, this came up yesterday, <laughs> this question of if we will, there, there can be a world where we don't have to think about MDBs write down everything or MDBs touch nothing. And I know it's a political hot potato, so it's very hard to go anywhere with it. But there is a world where a, if, if we were to agree, and it's not, I don't, you know, I'm not, it, there's no place it's written that MDBs are senior. But if you, we agreed and the international community and everybody agreed that MDBs were senior creditors, then there is a world where they are senior, which means they get written down last. So if it's really important that the MDB debt be written down to, to come to a solution, then it will be written down. It doesn't have to be 100% written down. It's they're the most senior creditor in the line, but senior creditors are part of bankruptcy proceedings as well. And so I think we have to maybe stop thinking yes or no and think about how do we, and then it's not as expensive for the donors to refinance the MDBs because we're not talking about writing down all of it. We're talking about writing down for certain countries and certain situations where the MDB debt really has to be written down for that country to get out of a debt trap. Um, First and second, first best and second best completely agree. In fact, I went back and looked at a book that we did in 20, 2002, and the, there was a solution, <laughs> which was the same exact solution we're talking about now, almost exactly the same. And it was, again, this two-phase solution of you have some sort of institution now, and then you have the bigger, yeah. So in a very much, again, this idea of having some sort of mechanism in one of the MDBs, or it could be outside of an MDB, in some sort of IFI, that is, that is thinking about writing that, that, is, that um, could be our, our proposal. Well, I won't go into that because we don't have time. But anyway, there, that, so yes. And, and in fact, when you have, if you were to really ever have a bankruptcy court, most cases are outside in the shadow of the court. The court is there to, to set the rules and then it makes negotiations much quicker and faster and, and, and better because everybody knows what the rules are. And so the idea of the court would not be to replace anything else. It would be to work alongside of it. Um, and then finally, the structure. I would just say on that that, um, that, that there, whatever happens now, let's really hope it's not. Um, HIPIC was wonderful because it, an MDRI wrote down debt. Really fantastic. But it wasn't an institutional change. And here we are X years later with the same thing. So I think whatever happens, I really hope that there is an institutional change so that it is something that can be, that the next time this, this happens, we have structures in place to deal with it. Thank you. And I'm just, I should probably go because I was told at 7.30 I'm going to get a phone call, so it's easier to. Okay. Thank you for your participation. Thanks so much, Shari. And just to say that, I think there is a difference in the acknowledgement of the debt crisis between official IMF and, and, and a lot of officials I've been talking to privately, uh, and same with the World Bank. And, um, uh, and I have spoken with quite a lot of um, finance officials from those countries that are affected, and they're all very clear. Yeah? And so, so I think the discussion has changed. Of course, the IMF is still publishing a paper, no, you know, we're nowhere near HIPIC. <laughs> so, um, but let me just address a couple of important points that were raised. Um, one thing is, uh, you know, uh, Bordeaux's point about common framework countries. How can you use that terrible common framework name? Uh, we actually had a bit of discussion. I was also, well, you know, I have a rather negative association with the common framework. Uh, the reality is that, um, you know, the Paris Club, uh, G20, they're all like the common framework. You know, that's what we have now. We've managed to have China in there. Everyone knows it's not working, but everyone's insisting that it's got to be the common framework. So kind of my first best solution would be let's get rid of the common framework and establish a new framework, which is called Debt Relief for Green Inclusive Recovery. Uh, but <clears throat> reality is we have to deal with a common framework. So what we're calling for is a very substantial reform of the common framework, which, yeah, you know, 
it's just keeping the name more or less. But anyway, you know, uh, you have to package your proposals politically uh, in a way that uh, kind of politically not not debt on arrival. Um, but <clears throat> so um, one key problem with the common framework is, of course, that um, it is so slow, and you know, kind of we've seen uh, uh, the process for the countries that entered it, and. The key message for everyone else in you know in this situation is like really try to stay away. Don't don't try to avoid to enter uh, this process because it's a very painful process. Um, <clears throat> you're going to stop in a doom loop for for quite some time. And so what we are facing now is the prospect of uh, doing too little too late. Uh, countries will go a long way to avoid having to. Uh, uh, restructure their debt, uh, and the result is, of course, that they will, you know, uh, service their debt and, and cut on everything they can cut, uh, and then we have these lost decades. Yeah, so we need a mechanism um, where countries actually feel okay. Um, it's worth going there because we will get a fair treatment, uh, and and it will be a relatively swift process, and and that's what we're trying to to propose here. And there we need incentives for, for both creditors and debtors to come together. And uh, that brings me to the question about the carrots and sticks, you know. So Bodo, you say that oh, you're, you're, you're giving out too many carrots, you don't, you know, the stick is not big enough. Um, well, I mean, we are saying, um, yes, there will be some partial credit enhancement, but it will be against a significant haircut. Yeah, so it's not, you know, they, they just get a credit enhancement, they get a significant haircut. And uh, the size of that has to depend on, on the debt sustainability analysis, uh, which really has to include climate risk, climate uh, investment needs, uh, SDG investment needs, and so on. So um, I don't think we're, we're giving out too, too generous a deal, but, but I think we do need to also take into account the realities, and, and the realities are also that um, you know, we need countries like the one we're in right now to also agree on this kind of proposal. And, and uh, so it has to be somewhere in the middle. Uh, and if, you know, uh, if what I get is that uh, we get quite a bit of pushback from different sides, so, so maybe we're, we are in the right spot. But, <clears throat> um, and I know Marina is getting... No, 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 it's, uh, we can, if security doesn't throw us, <laughs> away from the room, we can still admit well, a little bit. Well, I think bit, but the security is, is still going to be a long go, way. Yeah, because but, you're between <coughs> you and dinner, right? So. Ah, but who wants dinner? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, we will have the Cuban coffee service coming soon. <clears throat> uh, just quickly on the SDR, on the SDR rechanneling. Um, so yes, I'm very much aware of the problems with with with. The SDR rechelling pro process. It's very uh, frustrating. Of course, we should have a reform of the SDR system at large. But again, you know, that's nothing we have, we're going to have in the short term. But <clears throat> there are ways, and I mentioned already, uh, the, the um, uh, perpetual SDR bonds uh, that the World Bank can issue, which have reserve character status. Yeah? So the Bundesbank can buy these perpetual SDR bonds from the World Bank, and it's not technically an SDR rechanneling; it's just an investment of a central bank in assets they, you know, can invest in, and everyone else can do that. So, uh, and that's a proposal by Brad Setzer, by the way. And uh, so, I think you know we need to be a little bit creative. We need to to find ways of um, <clears throat> making things happen. And at the end of the day, and, and by the way, there are 650 uh, billion SDRs uh, among the G7 and uh, kind of rich countries and, and, and China. So the means are available to make things happen. We just need the political will. And, and, and that's, I think, the really critical point. We need to be very clear uh, that the whole SDG and climate agenda in a very large number of countries you know, it's going to break down completely if we're not going to if we're not going to tackle the debt crisis. Because, uh, you know, all these discussions about mobilizing climate finance, private capital, on, I mean, this hasn't been going tremendously well anyway. 
But uh, certainly, with, with, with this debt crisis unfolding, there's not going to be in any investment. Um, and um, so we have to be honest. Do we want countries to, to kind of move ahead with SDGs and so on? Or do we accept that you know, we're not just going to have three years of backsliding, but, but you know, two decades of backsliding? And in the face of a climate crisis and countries not being able to invest in adaptation resilience, this is going to be a great disaster. So we do need uh, to tackle the debt crisis. We need significant debt restructuring. And, and that brings me to the question about cancellation. I mean, we're talking yeah, about a partial uh, 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 cancellation. I mean, not, not just kind of everything, but uh, a significant amount. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. So now you are between. Yeah, it's. I'll, I'll be. I'll, I'll be brief. So, so to keep it entertaining. Um, yeah. People who, who people who start saying, "But I'll be brief," that, that's the worst. Yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, let's 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 play the 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 minister of finance game to 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 address uh, uh, the the issues raised by Jeff and 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 Aldo, right? So you're the minister of, of finance of Deadlandia, and you know the end game is is close. You don't have money, and you know that you're going to have to restructure. So then you know you wake up one day, and then you go and talk to to your president, and it's like, look, things are going bad. We're not going to have money by the end of the week. I think we should restructure. I think we should we should use the common framework. And then the president comes back and tells you, well, uh, okay, so how does this work? Well, actually, I'm not sure, okay? How long is this going to take? I don't know that either. And how much money are we going to get? Who knows? So how can you... You know, if, if you are the minister of finance of a country and you're responsible for what happens to the economy of your country, how can you consciously apply to a framework that doesn't give you any certainty of any kind? You can't. You, you prefer to, to stick to what you know, that it's a bad situation, but at least you have an understanding of what's happening, to, that to go to a path where you don't know where you're going to end up. So that's the first part. And the second part is like, okay, once you actually go and restructure, so, so this is addressing the, the Aldo's point, but then once you actually go to restructure, and this, I, I mentioned this in a, in a separate meeting today, it's like, well, okay, so, okay, I need to start calling people because we ran out of money. So who are the first people that you call? So the first call that you place is Washington. Why? Because you need to call the IMF because they need to, to, to give you a bridge down to, to, uh, to ensure that you have money to keep paying uh, oil and, and medicines and, and, and food. Where do you place your second call? Where you call Paris because you need Lazard to come and advise you on how to restructure the debt. And the third call that you place is either London or New York to hire lawyers to deal, with your, to, to, to deal with your process. And the crazy thing about all of this is that if you think about it, none of the, other, the people that is on the <coughs> other end of that call is going to answer the key question that, that the person that is placing the call has into its mind, which is what are the implications of all of this for the people of my country? Because the only people that have the answer to that question are not in those places, are in Buenos Aires, are in Lusaka, are in Colombo because they are the ones that are facing the consequences of dealing with this, with this, with this problem, which goes back to the issue of, of, of multilateralism. So, and, and this is the issue of, of capacity building, that, that we need to ensure that there is capacity building, but there is capacity building on, on this understanding of the implications of, of the problem. And just to, to conclude, the issue with, with the RST is just that Barbados and Costa Rica are in this uniquely bad confluence uh, of, of circumstances where they have both a long-term program under the GRA and the RST. And the combination of long-term programs means that they have to pay a substantial amount of, of, of interest, of surcharges under the GRA and the market rate under the, under the, under, under the RST. So this creates a situation that, that it creates a massive amount of accumulation of interest payments or the or the or the or the long run, which begs the question that I think there is a, sp a structural problem of the size with the RST that it was designed thinking that the low interest rates regime was going to last forever, 
But now that we're no longer there, there might be any, a discussion to create a system that caps the interest rate on the RST to ensure that you can have long-term uh, uh, borrowing from, from the IMF without creating this problem of, of substantial interest rates. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Okay. So thank you very much for actually sticking almost 15 minutes more. Hey. And <laughs> thank you very much for an awesome discussion. And yes, and see you, and see you tomorrow. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much.